Hey there, folks, and welcome back. I have one more example for you on using the generalized chain rule. In this example, we're going to be considering something called spherical coordinates, which is a coordinate system in R3. You know how in R2 we have a couple different ways of specifying the location of a point? We could use Cartesian coordinates x, y, or we could use polar coordinates rho, phi. Well, in R3, we have various choices as well. We could specify the location of a point using our Cartesian coordinates, x, y, z, or perhaps we could use something called spherical coordinates. This is a coordinate system with three variables, r, theta, and phi, and those three variables allow us to specify the location of points in R3. To convert between Cartesian and spherical coordinates, we can use these three formulas x equals r sine theta cos phi, y equals r sine theta sine phi, and z equals r cos theta. Now folks, at this stage, you're not expected to have these formulas memorized, and you're not expected to know exactly what r, theta, and phi represent. We will be using spherical coordinates later in our course when we talk about triple integrals, and at that point, all of this will be explained. But for now, just know that we're dealing with a new coordinate system with three variables, r, theta, phi, and we're going to be using this in a basic example on the generalized chain rule. Okay, on to our problem. In this question, we're given a function w that depends on our three Cartesian variables, x, y, and z. However, we want to compute the partial derivative of w with respect to one of our spherical coordinate variables, phi. Specifically, we want to evaluate that partial derivative at the point r theta phi equals 1 pi over 2 pi over 2. So here's our setup once again. We have a function w that depends on x, y, and z, but these variables in turn depend on r, theta, and phi. We are looking for the partial derivative of w with respect to phi. So perhaps we can use a tree diagram. We have w at the top x, y, and z at level 2, x depends on r, theta, and phi, y depends on r, theta, and phi, and z actually just depends on r and theta. Now if we want to find the partial derivative of w with respect to phi, we're going to follow every branch of this tree from w down to phi. That's going to give us partial w by partial phi equals partial w by partial x, partial x by partial phi, plus partial w by partial y, partial y by partial phi. And notice that since z doesn't depend on phi, we don't have to follow that branch at all. So there you go. This is the expression for partial w by partial phi. But hold on a second. We can actually calculate some of these derivatives. We have a formula that relates w to x, y, and z. And that's going to allow us to calculate partial w by partial x and partial w by partial y. We also have conversion formulas for x, y, and z into spherical coordinates. And we can use these formulas to calculate partial x by partial phi and partial y by partial phi. So let's first check the partial derivatives of w with respect to x and y. Partial w by partial x, according to this expression here, is y squared plus z whereas partial w by partial y is simply 2xy. Okay, two derivatives down, two to go. Let's see if we can find the partial derivative of x with respect to phi. We're going to treat r and theta like constants, so when we differentiate, r sine theta is just left alone. Then we take the partial derivative of cos phi with respect to phi. That gives us minus sine phi. As for the partial derivative of y with respect to phi, we do the same sort of thing. We leave r sine theta alone and then differentiate sine phi with respect to phi. That's going to give us cos phi. At this point, we can use these expressions for our partial derivatives in the formula below. This gives us partial w by partial theta equals y squared plus z times partial x by partial phi. That's minus r sine theta sine phi plus 2xy times partial y by partial phi, that's r sine theta cos phi. Now if we had just been asked for the partial derivative of w with respect to phi, our final step would be to replace x, y, and z using these expressions in spherical coordinates. 
right? We're asked for a partial derivative with respect to one of our spherical coordinates, so our final answer would have to be in terms of r, theta, and phi. But in this case, we're actually being asked to evaluate our derivative at a particular point. So rather than subbing in these bulky expressions for x, y, and z, why don't we evaluate this derivative by first figuring out what x, y, and z are when r theta phi is 1 pi over 2 pi over 2. That's exactly what we're going to do on the next slide. Okay, I've made a little bit more room for us, but I still have our expression for the partial derivative that we hope to evaluate at r theta phi equals 1 pi over 2 pi over 2, and I have our conversion formulas from Cartesian to spherical coordinates. We need to determine the values of x, y, and z at this point in spherical coordinates. So, what's the value of x when r theta phi is 1 pi over 2 pi over 2? Well, x is going to be 1 sine pi over 2 cos pi over 2. And since cos pi over 2 is 0, x is simply 0. We do the same for y. At this point in spherical coordinates, y is 1 sine pi over 2 sine pi over 2. That's 1. And finally, z is 1 cos pi over 2, which is 0. We can now wrap up our problem by plugging in these values of x, y, and z and these values of r theta phi into our partial derivative. That's a completely correct approach and it will lead you to the right answer. However, in this example, I think we can be a little sneaky. Rather than substituting six different variables, I could simply recognize that this expression in the brackets, minus r sine theta sine phi, is really minus y. And likewise, this expression in the brackets, r sine theta cos phi, well, that's really x. So I can think of this expression in terms of just x, y, and z. And then I only have to substitute three variables. Okay, so plugging in these values for x, y, and z, my first term, y squared plus z, is going to become 1 squared plus 0. My second term, minus y, is really minus 1. And then I add 2xy, that's 2 times 0 times 1, and then I multiply by x, which is 0. So you can see that the entire second term goes away, and I'm simply left with minus 1. 